This is Political Forum for Wednesday, January 8th, 2014. Uh, we welcome today as our guest, Alderman Joe Moore uh, from Chicago's Fighting 49th Ward. Uh, welcome back to Political Forum. Rod, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm Rod Joy, a board member here at Can TV. Uh, Political Forum is a live interactive call-in program that's designed to connect you uh, directly with your elected officials. Uh, for the next 25 minutes or so, we hope you'll have an opportunity to learn more about Alderman Moore and his views on some of the most uh, pressing uh, challenges and opportunities facing our city. Uh, above all, uh, this program is about fostering a, a strong sense of civic engagement uh, in Chicago. Uh, your voice is a key component of the program. Uh, we invite your calls, your questions, your comments for Alderman Moore. Uh, please join us at 312 738 one zero six zero three one two seven three eight ten sixty uh alderman moore welcome back to political forum thanks for having me uh for happy those happy new year by the happy way. new year to you too i'm glad you could make it uh, i think i'm the first guest of the new year it's been uh, a tradition thanks for bringing in the new year with us here at can tv uh for our viewers who uh, may not be familiar with the 49th ward uh what can you tell people about uh your ward well first i'll i'll, I'll tell folks where it's located for people who don't live in my ward it's located on uh, Chicago's far north side, uh, actually uh, right along Lake Michigan. Uh, we're as far north as you can get. Uh, the city of Evanston borders me on the north. Uh, Lake Michigan on the east. Uh, I go as far west as Western Avenue and uh, as far south um, as uh, Granville under the old map. But the new ward boundary, um, um, uh, Devon, is my southern boundary. And I include a little bit more of the Rogers Park community. Now, I would say about 85% of the Rogers Park community is in, in the 49th Ward. Terrific. We have uh, so many issues to dive into today. Uh, but for viewers who may be uh, meeting you for the first time, uh, you've been alderman since 1991. That's uh, right. What motivated you to get involved in, in uh, public service and politics here? Well, I've always been uh, very passionate about uh, government and politics, even as a young child. Uh, when I moved to uh, Rogers Park after I graduated from college in 1980, I became involved in, in the community, working on uh, school reform efforts, uh, um, uh, fighting for tenants' rights, uh, uh, formed a block club. So I was really very, very much involved in the community and also very involved politically uh, with uh, the organization of uh, Reform Alderman David Orr, who's now the Cook County Clerk. Uh, and when uh, David... Uh, uh, decided to run for county clerk uh, uh, back in 1990, uh, and it became very clear he was the odds-on favorite to win. Uh, I ran with his support for, for alderman. Uh, it was a very tough battle because uh, Mayor Daly had appointed another man to fill uh, the, David's vacancy, and so we had to take the incumbent alderman out, and we were able to do so in a tough battle. And, and the rest is history. I've been proud to represent uh, the, this great community of mine for the last uh, 23 years now. And you're known as a pioneer of uh, political reform and, and open government, and uh, I believe you're uh, the first, if not one of the first, elected officials to bring this concept of participatory budgeting to the U.S. I was actually the first. Uh, fortunately, I'm now, now not the only one. Uh, 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 several of my colleagues in the Chicago City Council are, have done participatory budgeting, and perhaps we should tell the viewers what that is. Uh, each alderman in Chicago gets uh, $1.3 million that they spend at their discretion on capital projects, uh, infrastructure projects in, in their wards. And uh, a few years ago, back in 2009, um, I decided to adopt this concept called participatory budgeting, which... Um, uh, which gives the people in a jurisdiction, usually it's a municipality, the power to decide by popular vote how to spend a portion of their tax dollars. Uh, it started in Brazil uh, 25 years ago. It's, it's spread throughout Latin America, South America, into Europe, but never in the United States until we brought it to the 49th Ward back in 2009. So uh, uh, we're in our fifth year of participatory budgeting, uh, where the voters in my community come up with project proposals, they decide which ones are worthy of being placed on an election ballot, and then the entire community votes on which projects they would like to see funded. Um, this year we've got some really interesting projects that uh, 
um, that the committees have been working on. There's a proposal to do um, uh, uh, a uh, expanding our series of uh, bike routes and bike paths on various various city streets. Uh, we're looking at doing some more murals, particularly in a new part of the ward where uh, uh, that we haven't done artistic murals there. Uh, under usually we do it under viaducts and brighten up dingy viaducts. Uh, we're looking at doing a water feature as a proposal for Potawatomi Park, a, a water park for, for kids, uh, having some walking paths through uh, Potawatomi Park. Um, again, street resurfacing is always incredibly important, uh, and we're clearly going to have more streets on the, on the uh, ballot this year and giving people an opportunity to vote on what percentage of the of the million dollars would be spent on streets. So it's a very exciting project uh, proposal. If anyone's interested in learning more about the process or getting involved, my ward uh, website, ward49.com, uh, has a, a page devoted to uh, participatory budgeting. Terrific. And participatory budgeting invites your constituents to kind of weigh in on how you dole out uh, those menu dollars. Not just weigh in, but actually decide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not going to a community meeting and, and expressing your views and hoping the elected officials listen. Uh, that's giving uh, real people real power to make real decisions. And speaking of giving real people real power, uh, we'd like to invite your questions and comments for Alderman Moore. Uh, this is a live interactive program, so please join us at 312-738-1060, 312-738-1060. And Alderman, I think we have a caller on the line. Great. Caller, are you there? Yeah, thank you for taking my call. Um, Alderman, I live in the Rogers Park neighborhood, and I was just curious, um, now that we've had heavy snow, I've seen people uh, putting dibs, either chairs or or a table or something to uh, mark their spot after they clear it, um, as far as their car is concerned. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I you know I understand the motivation for doing that. Uh, parking's at a, a real premium in my community. And um, so I understand someone who spent some time digging their car out, car out would kind of feel as though it was their spot. Uh, unfortunately, it's not; a, it's against the law. And the city has announced that uh, uh, beginning uh, today that they would be removing uh, those uh, those pieces of furniture, and and that the the streets are owned by the public, and and they're and anyone should be allowed to park uh, wherever they. Uh, can do according to the parking regulations. But I am sensitive about the lack of parking. I drove around my community last night and uh, I saw no available parking. Um, that's why I supported a proposal to bring 250, uh, uh, a 250 car parking garage in my community that will provide relief for our parking starved community, particularly this time of year where Parking is a real premium because, number one, you can't park on Clark Street overnight. Number two, the snow makes it, uh, you know, makes it much more difficult to park, and there's more space between the cars, so uh, taking up available parking. And so this parking structure, which I hope will be up and running by next winter, um, uh, will give uh, people some real relief so they don't feel like they have to uh, carve out a space uh, 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 to uh, park their car. And the caller mentioned, <clears throat> you know, this time-honored tradition of dibs. Yes. Um, but it, it also brings to mind just the brutal weather that we've endured yeah. here in Chicago. And can you talk a little bit about sure. how I'm, you've responded to this yeah, most recent uh, We winter? have, uh, it's been very difficult because not only did you have about a week of unrelenting snow, it was a light snow, but it kept snowing. So ultimately, Unlike a storm where you might dump 10 inches in one day and the next day the plows come out and clear the snow, this was a, a you know, unrelenting storm that went on and on and on. Uh, and uh, we ended up getting about 10 inches in the 49th Ward in Rogers Park, um, but it was done over a week. So a lot of salt was used, a lot of uh, city dollars were spent, and then we had the brutal temperatures. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that the road salt that we use only is good in temperatures above zero degrees. When those temperatures drop below zero, that road salt doesn't work. And that snow and ice turns into rock solid like granite, and it becomes almost impossible for the, 
for the, the plows to pick them up. So even though we've been plowing and salting on a regular basis in the ward and indeed throughout the city, um, it doesn't look like it because of the, the brutal uh, temperatures. Uh, today, for the first time, the temperatures moderated. We're, we're now in the teens. Feels like a and, heat wave. And that salt is starting to take effect, and and the ice is starting to become slush. So we had a plow devoted just to my ward today, starting to clear those streets out. And I anticipate by the time the weekend comes around, because it's going to get in the 20s tomorrow and in the 30s on Friday, that uh, the streets will, and the residential streets will be as clear as the arterial streets are and it'll give a little bit of relief. But I wanted to let people know uh, who felt that maybe, you know, the plows hadn't been down their street, that the reason it was it's taken so long to get that snow up is because of the brutal temperatures. You're watching Political Forum. This is a live interactive call-in program. Uh, we invite you to flex your activism muscles by uh, joining us and uh, you know, posing your question or comment for Alderman uh, Joe Moore. I think we have another caller on the line. Uh, caller, are you there? Uh, yes, I want to make a couple of points. Uh, one to the alderman's point that he just made in terms of the effectiveness of road salt used by the city of Chicago. It's actually only marginally effective above 20 degrees. Once you go below the 20 degree mark, it becomes less effective. And once you're in the single digits, it's virtually unaffected. Right. So um, we need to be clear. We need to get days like tomorrow, which are going to be in the 20s, where because today, if you ride out on the Chicago street, even though it's not as cold as it was, the reality is that there's still plenty of snow on the street with, that's been salted, and there's a reason for that. It's still too cold for it to be terribly effective. Secondly, with regard to this question of participatory democracy and, um, uh, and, and the notion of what, you know, in some places like California, or referendums and, and the idea that getting more people involved, I mean, that, that is a double-edged sword in the view of a great many people. I think it's wonderful that we get people involved in public policy making. On the other hand, there is a reason why we have professional public poly, political, professional political scientists and public policy analysts. Uh, I, I pursue three degrees in the field, and I can't begin to tell you the number of things I'm not qualified to address in the fields of public policy. Uh, so I'm a little bit taken aback when we say in a constitutional republic, we're going to grant power to people who frankly don't have the qualifications to make a great many decisions now, I think that on some minor issues, it, it's wonderful to have input and perhaps even have a referendum and a vote and they can decide. But on certain major public policy issues, I don't think the average Joe Schmo, I mean, it's wonderful if you're a carpenter, you're a plumber, you're a doorman, you're a taxi cab driver, but it really takes a great deal of experience and education and insight uh, to decide major public policy issues. And I agree with the caller on that. Uh, I... Uh... I don't believe every uh, law we vote on in the city council should be put up to a popular vote because, as the caller said, um, uh, people don't have the opportunity and, and, and the time to seriously consider every single issue. But what makes participatory budgeting uh, work well in my neighborhood and has worked well throughout is the process is not a just, it, it's a, delib a very deliberative process. It's a year-long process where um, the community residents who volunteer to help design the projects really work at researching the projects. They deliberate with their neighbors. They talk to experts. Um, these are very, very thoughtful proposals. And then when we put them on the ballot, we do an, an active effort to engage and educate the voters. Uh, the ballot gives a description of what each project is about, uh, what its estimated cost is. Uh, so uh, people... We want people to be informed because, as the caller noted, um, you know, if if you don't have an informed electorate, you end up could get, end up getting some very disastrous public policy. So, uh, what this participatory budgeting process does is it gives people the power, but it makes sure that the people exercise that power in a wise and judicious fashion. Terrific. I think we have another caller on the line. Caller, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Um, I heard about the establishment of the new independent budget office. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious just about, number one, if you think it'll be effective in its job, and also if it's got enough support. Cause it, it seems like a really big task to have to, like, you know, fact check and run the numbers on, you know, proposed uh, legislation. So I'm just kind of curious about how you think it'll work. Well, uh, thanks for that question. I've been a longtime proponent of, uh, of having a city council independent budget office modeled after the um, 
after the Congressional Budget Office that provides Congress with independent budget analysis of proposals that the president makes. In this case, we're going to have an office that will allow us to provide an independent analysis of budget proposals made by the mayor, proposals for tax increment financing, and other financial issues that, quite frankly, members of the city council don't have the expertise or the time to really delve into. Uh, this office will give us the tools to be able to do that so that we can uh, put another set of eyes and on, on these very complicated budgetary proposals. It's particularly important this year because we have a big, big challenge with the city pension funds. Uh, right now, the state legislature put into effect a law that requires us to have a balloon payment of, of over $600 million to satisfy our obligations to the uh, police and fire pension funds. That's, if that law goes in effect, that's going to blow a huge hole in the city budget. And we need to have uh, an office that's independent of the mayor um, uh, to examine these uh, proposals and how to address that independently, as well as, as well as all the other budget proposals that the mayor comes up with. Um, I will have to give kudos to, to Mayor Emanuel because, as I indicated, this is something I've been pushing for years, but under the previous mayor, it went nowhere. Uh, but uh, the mayor working with uh, Alderman Amaya Pawar, Alderman Michelle Smith, and Alderman Pat Dahl, who were the main sponsors of this current proposal, uh, they were able to come up with something that, that received city council support and that I think will be a very, very useful tool to the city council, who are the representatives of the people, to make sure that we don't make kind of the mistakes that we've made in, in the past and, uh, and really give uh, the mayor's financial uh, proposals a really serious look yet. And the Office of Financial Analysis was unanimously approved by the City Council last month. Uh, what's the time horizon for when the office well, will be Well, right now uh, we are in the process of uh, beginning to accept uh, applications for uh, a person who would be the executive director or the, the chief uh, officer of this uh, Office of Financial Accountability and, um, and uh, hope to have that person on board within the next several months. So quite frankly, anyone with, uh, uh, with some experience in budget analysis, uh, uh, feel free to submit your resume uh, to me and I will pass it on to, to uh, the, the members of the City Council that will be considering uh, this, this uh, uh, new um, uh, position, staff position. This is Political Forum, a live interactive call-in program. Our guest today is Alderman Joe Moore from Chicago's 49th Ward. Uh, we invite your calls, your questions, your comments. I think we have uh, another caller on the line. Uh, caller, are you there? Yes. Good Hello. evening. Yes, I had a comment I wanted to make. Great, go uh, for it. The comment had to do with the fact that he indicated that People shouldn't be putting things out on the streets to save parking spots when the snow is out here. Well, guess what? When you are old, you live in a spot, you pay somebody 20 to $30 to clean out a spot so you can come there and park and come in your house or you're old now. Uh, and you said we can't save that spot because people will come up there and just park in it. They don't care how old you are or how much you pay to have it done. But they don't usually get out and move stuff. So maybe the, the, the city council should consider uh, making uh, it so that people can get a plaque to park on their street as opposed to other people just coming in and finding a good parking spot. Well, uh, hopefully um, the caller is aware of um, the uh, uh, handicapped parking uh, 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 signs that uh, that eligible people, people who have uh, uh, mobility impairment, who uh, have difficulty uh, walking long distances. They are uh, with a doctor's uh, letter that, uh, that states that they do have a mobility impairment. They can go to the Secretary of State's office and get one of those handicapped placards. And once you get one of those, you are eligible to get a sign that you can put in front of your home, uh, assuming you don't have a uh, uh, parking behind your home or in a garage or anything that allows you to park in front of your home. So um, uh, I, I don't uh, I don't know I, uh, uh, the 
physical condition of the woman who called, but perhaps that's something she can look into if, if she isn't able to walk long distances. Uh, and then she'll have a, a guaranteed spot in front of her home. So a lot of interest in this notion of dibs. Um, let's talk about another Chicago tradition uh, or iconic institution, and that's Dominic's in the grocery oh, yes. store chain. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Dominic's has roots in this city tracing all the way back to 1952. Even um, even before then, actually. Yeah, the, the original owner, I think the first Dominic's store opened up in the 1920s. No kidding. So they've been almost in this city almost 100 years. Uh, so uh, you're on uh, the mayor's task force mm -hmm. to, to, to really look at this notion of the Dominic stores throughout the city and uh, identify. Right. The, uh, the mayor organized a task force uh, to address the issues involving the closing of the Dominic stores. My community is one of many communities throughout the city of Chicago and indeed the suburbs who were affected by the, their grocery store closing. Um, uh, we have a uh, we had a Dominic's at the Gateway Shopping Center, which was the large uh, shopping center located in my community, uh, up by Howard Street and Clark Street. Uh, the that store is closed. Um, I know there are a lot of discussions going on with potential grocers who are interested in moving into that location. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to report at this point in time. Uh, but um, uh, as I indicated, I have uh, the mayor has appointed me to a task force to. Uh, to whose charge is to try to identify potential retailers for uh, closed Dominic stores and to ensure that communities, particularly communities that are so-called food deserts that don't have other grocery options, uh, that we address that in a very systematic way. Uh, the first meeting of the task force is tomorrow, uh, and uh, I know uh, I will have more to report after that meeting uh, to my constituents. Uh, uh, but. Uh, one thing that uh, clearly is at the top of my list is identifying another grocery store for that Gateway uh, Center location. Now, we talked a, a bit earlier about participatory budgeting and inviting constituents to uh, weigh in on uh, the, the menu funds in your ward. I think you're also inviting your constituents to weigh in on the fate of the old Greenleaf Avenue firehouse in the 49th Ward. Can you say a few words about sure. that? Sure. Sure. Um, uh, we have an old firehouse uh, on Greenleaf Avenue, just uh, east of Clark Street. Um, uh, a few years ago, back in 2009, a new fire station opened in our community, one we'd been working really hard to get. Uh, on, uh, they're up on Clark Street across from Tui Park. Uh, but the old station is now decommissioned. Um, and uh, I wor I've been working with the city and uh, Mayor Emanuel's administration to have a process in place to ha have my community help determine uh, the future use for that site. Uh, we put out a request for proposals, received 16 different proposals of different parties who, who had proposals for the, the site. One was, um, you know, many were uh, uh, turning the building into a single family home. Uh, others were talking about a community center. We had a full, uh, full range of it. So we've narrowed down my, I had, uh, had my zoning advisory committee, a committee of neighborhood residents and representatives of the major community organizations that advised me on all zoning and land use issues to, to help me winnow down the 16 initial applications to three finalists. We're having a community meeting on Monday night uh, at the United Church of Rogers Park located at the corner of, of Ashland and Morse Avenue and the three finalists will be making presentations to the community, and then the, the committee of, and I will be listening to what the community residents have to say about those presentations, and that will inform our decision as to what uh, ultimately which um, uh, proposal uh, we're, we, will, we will accept. Um, there is a uh, proposal from the Northside Community Resource Center, uh, uh, which is a long-established community organization, uh, the Hare Krishna Temple has got a very exciting proposal, and we also have a proposal for an eco-friendly um, uh, residence uh, and and art center that's been put together by a very interesting group. So, those are some of the. I encourage everyone to come to the meeting seven o'clock next Monday, and give us your opinion. Terrific. We'd like to thank uh, our guest today, Alderman Joe Moore from the 49th Ward, for joining us again. Uh, in order for our democracy to work, we need an informed and engaged citizenry. So we'd like to thank you, 
uh, for tuning in uh, and for calling in, and we invite you to join us next Wednesday for the next edition of Political Forum. Thank you. Thanks very much.